Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us here today at the Sunshine Cathedral via the website. And we want to welcome you to our worship services whenever you're in the Fort Lauderdale area. If you are in the area, we invite you to worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 a.m. We're located at 1480 Southwest 9th Avenue. And for those who watch us weekly on the internet, we invite you to check our website often for other listings and programming that we might have that may be of interest to you. And for now, I invite you to come in and worship with us here at the Sunshine Cathedral. reading is from the book of John. There was a man named John who was sent by God. He came to tell people about the light. Through him, all people could hear about the light and believe. The true light was coming into the world. The true light gives light to all. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Our second reading is from the wisdom of Desmond Tutu. Hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Our third reading is from the gospel according to Matthew. The birth of Jesus took place like this. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. Before they came to the marriage bed, Joseph discovered that she was pregnant. Joseph, chagrined but noble, determined to take care of things quietly so Mary would not be disgraced. While he was trying to figure a way out, he had a dream. God's angel spoke to him in the dream. Joseph, don't hesitate to get married. She will bring a son to birth. And when she does, you, Joseph, will name him Jesus. Then Joseph woke up. He did exactly what God's angel commanded in the dream. He married Mary, and after the baby was born, he named the baby Jesus. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Would you please pray with me? May God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. Well, I almost never do this because it's always done so well to begin with, but I want to uh, reread the gospel passage because it's so central to what I want to say to you today. So let's just uh, hear once again. Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. 
Joseph discovered she was pregnant. Joseph, chagrined but noble, determined to take care of things quietly so Mary would not be disgraced. While he was trying to figure a way out, he had a dream. God's angel spoke in the dream. Joseph, don't hesitate to get married. She will bring a son to birth, and when she does, you, Joseph, will name him Jesus. Then Joseph woke up. He did exactly what God's angel commanded in the dream. He married Mary, and after the baby was born, he named the baby Jesus. This is really, even yet, if we, we've heard it so many times that we don't really hear it anymore, but when we hear it, if we were to hear it as if for the first time, it's a compelling and shocking story. Even today, I mean, our, our mores, our values are a little different than they were in the early first century uh, in another part of the world, and yet even still, uh, it would be uh, difficult and stunning news for someone to hear uh, that someone he's about to marry uh, is pregnant, and he didn't have anything to do with it. That would still be shocking news. Mary has become pregnant before she's married, and the person to whom she's engaged is not the father. If that would be a little bit of a jolt in the 21st century, imagine the year 29 of the Common Era. It's an absolute scandal. It can ruin Mary's life, and it's no piece of cake for Joseph. In an honor-shame society, his honor is very much bruised in this situation. What's he going to do? What can he do? What is he compelled to do? What is his obligation in such a situation? He's hurt. Of course he's hurt. He loves Mary, but she's pregnant, and that wasn't part of the deal. She's pregnant, and he doesn't even know everything about her yet. He doesn't know where all the freckles are yet, and she's pregnant. That could be a deal breaker. Now, we have a pretty sanitized version of the story, but when Joseph gets news of it, all he knows is that his fiancée is pregnant and not by him. He's got some stuff to work through. He's embarrassed. What will people say? Well, he knows very well what some people will say. What are they going to say? What are they going to think of him? And what are they going to think of the woman he has given his heart to and who he is now questioning and doubting? And he's grieving. He has already, with this news, experienced loss. His family hasn't even gotten off the ground yet. They haven't exchanged their vows yet. They, they haven't started their family. He is, but he knows he wants a family with this person. And so his dreams of this family are now in jeopardy. And at any rate, it's not going to be the way he had thought and hoped and assumed. And so there's already a sense of loss. And he's grieving. He's losing a life that he was counting on sharing with someone. And so Joseph, obviously, would be in a lot of pain. Now, I don't know much about Joseph. There's not much about him in the New Testament. I can't even prove that he was an historical person. Some scholars even uh, suggest very real doubt. But I do believe that Mary had an unplanned pregnancy. That's not the sort of thing one would make up. When you're writing a story about your heroes or about yourself or about your community or about your vision, it's always to make your folks look good. And so that this story is in there makes me think there is probably some fact to it. I do believe she had an unplanned pregnancy that put her life and her security and her reputation at risk. And that grace miraculously brought something beautiful and powerful out of the situation. And according to the story, Joseph was a conduit of that grace. In any case, Joseph represents the emotions and challenges that come from receiving difficult news. And he also represents the possibility of working through difficult news to experience something creative and life-giving in spite of the difficult news. 
So what does Joseph have to teach us today on this fourth Sunday of Advent? Well, first of all, Joseph discovered something. He discovered that Mary was pregnant. We don't like discovery sometimes. Sometimes we will go to great lengths to avoid discovery. There are two uh, scales in my gym. And I know this because I walk by them every day. Now, you'd think since I'm walking by them, I would just step on one of them. One of them is electronic. One of them is the old kind, you know, where you, you do the balance and it's more accurate. I, I don't even, th I forget about that one. It's just, it's uh, these scales. I go out of my way to avoid discovering what they might have to say about the results of my exercise. It's not that funny. <laughs> Enjoyed that a little bit too much. <laughs> Maybe sometimes we delay going to the doctor because we we don't want to discover uh, bad news. Maybe we don't want to admit that we have a habit that's hurting us because to admit that we have the habit then will challenge us to do something about us about it. We don't like discovering. Uh, Things. We don't like uh, surprises sometimes, especially if the news isn't to our liking. But we can't solve problems that we won't face. And so discovery is the first step to overcoming a problem. Discovering that there is a challenge, a difficulty, then gives us the chance to work on a plan for addressing the problem. We, uh, ought, we used to have to really encourage people to get tested for HIV. A lot of people, they were afraid to get tested because they didn't, there was no cure. There weren't very many treatments and none that were effective for very long and so they were scared to get tested. And yet, we had to assure each other, knowing is better than not knowing because knowing then you have a plan. The plan to just pretend it's not out there and maybe it won't knock on my door, it's not really a plan. And so to get the information and then have a plan is empowering. We can't solve a problem we won't face. And so discovery is the first step to overcoming a problem. Discovering that there is a challenge, a difficulty, then gives us the chance to work on the plan to address the problem. Joseph didn't enjoy his discovery. He was devastated by this discovery. But learning what needed some focused attention enabled him to formulate a plan to make things better going forward. Then Joseph decided to take action. The text says that he determined to take care of things. The first step, taking that first class, turning in that first job application, showing up for that first 12-step meeting, deciding to make that doctor's appointment, choosing to be open and honest with the counselor. It's sometimes easy enough to get into the therapist's office, but then what? If we don't talk, then the clock is just ticking and, and, and we're being charged for nothing. We have to then decide, I'm really going to share. I'm really going to try to unburden myself and work through these issues. That decision that, 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 that determination to make up your mind, to invite God into a situation, that deciding to pray again. Sometimes we get out of the habit of prayer, or sometimes we're so angry with the God of our understanding that we just don't even want to communicate with that God. And so the decision to pray again, that can be so life-transforming. That decision to worship again, that decision to summon hope from the depths of your soul again, that moment of decision opens the doors for miracles. Doing something, not something rash or ill-considered, but doing something constructive feels better than doing nothing. The treatment that doesn't work still feels better than not trying. The interview that didn't result in employment still, still feels better than not making the effort. The workout that didn't magically melt away all the pounds still leaves us in better condition than being sedentary. But guess what? Sometimes the effort does pay off. So not only does trying feel better than not trying, but sometimes trying leads to success. After Joseph discovered the problem, he decided to do something. 
And once he made that decision, he had a dream. Joseph dreamed of possible healing outcomes. The story says that while he was trying to figure things out, actually trying to figure a way out, Joseph had a dream. And it was a beautiful dream. In this dream, Joseph didn't lose his family. In this dream, his love for Mary was more powerful than the social customs and mores that had been trespassed. In his dream, he would give her child a name and love it as his own. In his dream, he would choose love and dare to form an unconventional family. And he would face an uncertain future because love was worth it. Love makes a family and Joseph would have his. Joseph discovered a challenge in his life and he decided to do something about it and he dreamed of how it might work out for the good of everyone concerned. And then Joseph took action. He did what his dream indicated was possible. Learning there is a problem, deciding that we want to address it, dreaming about how it could all turn out, mean very little if we then don't take action. Joseph dreamed of working through the issues with Mary, of keeping his family together, of facing the unknown future with courage and hope, and then he proceeded to do just that. He chose to act as if the dream could become a reality. He learned there was a challenge. He decided that he would face it somehow, that he would do something. As he was trying to figure out exactly what to do, he dared to dream of ways that things could get better. And then he followed the dream and actually did the work of embracing Mary and naming and providing for the child and moving forward with his new family into the future. Whatever the issue, If we will face it, if we will make a decision to deal with it, if we will dream of possible solutions, and then if we will work the plan that comes from the decision and the dream, we will feel empowered, and we might even find ourselves victorious over the challenge. Discovery, decision, dreaming, and doing. That's the practical application of the Joseph story for us today. It's a good reminder that when we are facing a challenge, we have tools to navigate the challenge. Whether it is emotional, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whether it's relational, whether whatever it is we are facing, no matter how overwhelming it may seem at first, we have the tools to navigate the challenge. I'll end with a story that's very dear to me. You see, about 63 years ago, there was a challenge in Oklahoma, and it had to be addressed. In 1953, the Oklahoma City Zoo needed funds to get their first ever hippopotamus. It was in the news, I see you heard. Gayla Peavy had recorded a song. It had been written three years earlier. She recorded it, I Want a Hippopotamus for Christmas. The zoo used the popularity of the song as a fundraising campaign to get a hippo for Gala. And the campaign raised $3,000, which is over $27,000 of today's money. And they bought Gala a hippo, which she immediately donated to the Oklahoma City Zoo. What was she going to do with a hippo at home? So she gave the hippo to the zoo, which was always the plan. The zoo discovered a need decided to take action, dreamed of success, and then did what they could to make the dream come true. Trial to triumph, and my favorite Christmas song to boot. I want a hippopotamus for Christmas. Only a hippopotamus will do. Don't want a doll, no dinky tinker toy. I want a hippopotamus to play with and enjoy. I want a hippopotamus for Christmas. I don't think Santa Claus will mind you. He won't have to use the dirty chimney flue. 
just bring him through the front door. That's an easy thing to do. I can see me now on Christmas morning creeping down the stairs. Oh, what joy and what surprise when I open up my eyes and see a hippo hero standing there. I want a hippopotamus for Christmas. Only a hippopotamus will do. No crocodiles or rhinoceroses. I only like what hippopotamuses. And hippopotamuses like me too. I really mean it. And hippopotamuses like me too. And this is the good news. Amen. The Apostle Paul wrote, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the life of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the community of Christ? Because the loaf of bread is one, we though many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Sunshine Cathedral, we practice an open communion. What that means is you don't have to be a member of this church or of any church to receive the sacrament. Just as you are, with whatever your beliefs or doubts may be, you are welcome to participate in this feast of unconditional love.
Thank you for joining us today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. If you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, we invite you to stop by and worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, or if you'd like to find out other resources that the cathedral has to offer, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, we look forward to seeing you here at the Sunshine Cathedral.